Well, first, I have to tell you that Joe Starita's book is fabulous if you have not yet read it. I was in D.C. with uh, Joe and with Justice Sotomayor celebrating the legend and the legacy of Chief Standing Bear, and it is a message that is influencing and inspiring people all across the country, and the epicenter of that is Omaha, and much of that is due to Joe Starita. So uh, if you haven't read the book yet, read the book. <laughs> now is the law of the jungle as old and as true as the sky, and the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break it must die. As the creeper that circles the tree trunk the law runneth forward and back, for the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. That verse by Rudyard Kipling inspired Sir Robert Baden Powell to found the international scouting movement in 1907. He observed that boys naturally form gangs, or packs, of about six or seven, and they look to a leader among themselves, like a Kayla, the alpha wolf in the Rudyard Kipling novel, The Jungle Book. Sir Baden Powell wanted to use these principles of nature to help boys learn skills and ethics. He called the younger scouts the wolf cubs. In 1910, Juliet Gordon Lowe founded the Girl Scouts. She was also inspired by a story written by a British author, Juliana Horatia Ewing. In that story, the brownies awoke before the rest of the family. They swept the hearth, they lit the fire, they fixed the breakfast, they tidied the room, they weeded the garden, they did all the housework, and they were never seen. They refused to accept any wages. They did all their work out of love. I was a brownie <laughs> for way too long. <laughs> When I look back at the 60 years of history that I've observed firsthand, and I consider the achievement gap that still persists between men and women in so many areas of society, I attribute much of that gap to two different codes of ethics applied disproportionately by the two sexes, the code of the wolf pack and the code of the brownies. If you were raised to believe that you're a valuable member of the pack, then you're going to take good care of yourself, physically, emotionally, and financially, because the strength of the pack is the wolf. You're also going to look after the interests of others who are like you, because the strength of the wolf is the pack. You may not care very much about how others outside the pack think and feel, you only need to know their vulnerabilities. On the other hand, if you were raised to believe that your principal purpose in life is service to others, then you're going to take good care of your family, your children, your spouse, your parents, your spouse's parents, your employer, your customers, and your shareholders, but you may not perceive a responsibility to yourself you may not even view your money, your time, and your life choices as your own. You won't be likely to risk your life savings on a startup venture or work for years pursuing a contingency fee. You'll take a safe job in a position that's a supporting role, a job that provides health insurance for your family, and flexibility that allows you to take care of the needs of others. You won't negotiate your salary. You won't ask for raises or promotions. You may not even take credit for your own achievements. After all, brownies are never seen, and they refuse to accept any wages. They do all of their work out of love. I'm going to give a few examples of wolf pack ethics that I've observed over the years, and then I'll offer a few suggestions for the wolves and the brownies among us. My first job was helping my father in his law office on Saturday mornings when I was 10 years old. I heard an earlier speaker, Scott uh, Blake, make reference to Kurt Anderson. Kurt Anderson also worked in that law office. He was nine years old. 
and uh, Karen Borchert's grandpa worked in the same office. I noticed that the forms in the office, the legal forms, were different depending upon whether they were for a man or for a woman. If the form was for a woman, her financial interests were placed in the protection of a man. One day I asked one of the lawyers why the wills provided for inheritance to go directly to sons but be placed in trust for daughters. After all, why should Kurt Anderson get his inheritance outright and be able to write novels while I have to wait for mine as it's placed in trust, if any? The lawyer said, a man knows who his sons are, but he may not know who his sons-in-law will be. It took me years to figure that one out. <laughs> I asked another partner in the firm why there was so little interaction between the lawyers, who were all men, and the secretaries, who were all women, although they were called girls, no matter how old they were. The partner told me the story of a brilliant young lawyer who became attracted to a secretary. The lawyer was married, but that was not an ethical problem. The secretary may not have welcomed the lawyer's advances, but that was not an ethical problem. The problem occurred when the lawyer gave the secretary partnership funds in exchange for her affections. That was a serious breach of ethics, and the young lawyer was banished in shame. In school, I read many wonderful books, the Yearling, Johnny Tremaine, The Red Badge of Courage, Shane, Treasure Island. One year I looked at the list of assigned reading and I asked the teacher why all the books were about boys. She said, girls will read about boys, but boys have no interest in reading about girls. In high school, the athletic teams were only for boys, the inter-school teams, and I asked the principal why. He said, college athletic scholarships could be available to boys, and they needed to learn to work together as a team. They would need that skill later in life. When I applied to colleges, all of the military schools were closed to girls, as were most all the Ivy League schools, so I applied to Stanford University, a university that admitted one woman for every two men. After I was safely enrolled, I met with the Dean of Admissions to ask why the university could not offer equal opportunity for women, especially in light of its commitment to affirmative action for other disadvantaged groups. The Dean explained the university's founding documents to me, and then he said, these other groups have communities that we're trying to lift up. There is no community of women. When I graduated from law school, many firms still refused to interview women at all. One lawyer who did grant me an interview said, if I worked in his firm, I'd have to stay in a back office out of sight because his clients would never work with a woman. In the 1990s, during the Monica Lewinsky scandal, I heard male commentators say, Bill Clinton owes Monica Lewinsky's father an apology. Monica's father entrusted his daughter to Clinton's care, and Clinton breached that trust. When the Supreme Court declared that an underage female seeking an abortion could bypass parental consent by going to a judge, a male judge I admire very much said to me, if I approved such a request, how could I face the girl's father? What if he approached me one day in the parking lot what would I say to him? When we hear about atrocities committed against women around the world, the men who speak out against the atrocities generally say to their countrymen, what if this were your wife, your daughter, your mother, your sister? No one says, how would you feel if this were you? Because that's impossible to imagine but they do recognize a duty that runs from man to man. Now, I've defined these two codes of ethics. We've given them a name, we know what to call the behavior, so where do we go from here? Well, I've heard that TED Talks are supposed to have three takeaway points, so I'm gonna give you three. 
Albert Schweitzer said, the first step in the evolution of ethics is a sense of solidarity with other human beings. That means all people of goodwill are members of the pack. As a member of the pack, you have an obligation to yourself, a duty to yourself to look after yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, professionally, morally, and ethically, because the strength of the pack is the wolf. You also have an obligation to all other people of goodwill to help them achieve their full potential, to help them develop and use their talents because the strength of the wolf is the pack. Second, there is a community of women. It's not a wolf pack. It doesn't exist for the purpose of excluding anyone or gaining an advantage over anyone. But if you're a woman and you're doubting your abilities or you're discouraged by the burdens of caring for too many people or you've become the object of abuse at home or at work, you don't have far to look to find a community of women who will lift you up. When Madeleine Albright was in Omaha not long ago, she said, there is a special hell for women who don't help other women. <laughs> in my experience, there are very few women destined for that hell. Third, service to others is the pinnacle of ethics. People who choose careers involving an element of service should be honored and admired. But no one should aspire to be a brownie. They're mythical creatures, for God's sake. <laughs> so, male or female, if anyone here has been following the brownie code of ethics, when you go home tonight, I want you to go outside, I want you to take a good look at the moon, I want you to get in touch with your inner wolf <laughs> and make a pledge to take good care of yourself, to reach for that moon, and to achieve your full potential because you are not just a valuable member of the pack. You are Akela, the leader, and we've been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs>